you all for coming. I want to welcome um, Larry Swedro and Sam Adams, who are here to tell us a little bit about um, ESG investing. And so, um, as I was mentioning earlier, the Bainbridge Community Foundation has a has a high priority in uh, in this kind of investing. Um, we have about 90% of our overall assets in uh, socially responsible investments, either value screened or ESG. And, um, and it's a marketplace in which uh, many people are, are unaware really of, of what that means, or um, certainly lots of perceptions around whether, um, whether you're actually taking a, a financial risk, uh, a greater financial risk by investing in those kinds of strategies. So I'm delighted that Sam and Larry are here to help us with that. Uh, and Paul Merriman uh, is joining us as well, who will be um, facilitating today's conversation uh, with Larry and Sam. Paul is a former board member of the Community Foundation. He is a longtime um, advocate for financial education. Uh, with, during his, his professional career, he, he built a, a very successful um, firm. And in retirement, he decided he wanted to make sure that anyone, regardless of their, of their asset base, would have access to terrific um, financial education and resources. So we've been delighted to partner with Paul and the Merriman Education Foundation to put together our financial literacy series um, for April. And uh, if you have not signed up for our last session, we encourage you to go to our website at bainbridgecf.org. That is a focus on social security. And um, we'll be hearing from Mary Beth Franklin on that topic. So. With that, Paul, I'm going to introduce it to you and let you introduce our guest today. Great. I am so embarrassed. This is two weeks in a row that I had a technical problem with being too old. I know it's just because I'm old, but I'm here. I made it. Uh, I am so happy to be here with Sam and Larry. They are two very special people in our industry. Uh, there's a part of me that would say uh, uh, that, that, that certainly Larry Swedro doesn't need any introduction, but it turned out I saw in a, in a, a survey today that less than 50% of the people in the United States know what an index fund is. So if they don't know what an index fund is, they probably don't know Larry Swedro. But uh, Larry has been uh, one of the great educators, truly, uh, in, in our industry. He has written some 17 books, either by himself or with others. He has written simple books. He's written complex books on, on subjects that, that probably professionals have more interest in uh, than amateurs. But And he writes all over the internet, and I will tell you, he has supposedly responded according to the Bogleheads uh, and, and one other organization, don't remember who they are, over 15,000 entries answering people's questions. And Larry, I have had so many people tell me, I emailed him and he answered me back almost the same day. So uh, I got to tell you, you are, uh, you, you're a hero and uh, th this may not be any big deal to you because you've had so many awards. But as of today, in our newsletter, we announced that Larry Swedro is one of the Merriman Foundation truth tellers. So well, we don't I have any plaques. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then, and so thank you, Larry, for being here. It, this, is, this is great. And uh, Sam, uh, you may not even remember me. I, I met you way back. I remember back. you, Paul. Do you? <laughs> yeah, I totally remember you. Well, I remember way back at, at, uh, at DFA. And, uh, and, and my, my memory is, is of just meeting a really, really nice person. And uh, everybody seemed to think you were just fantastic. I never worked directly with right. you on your right. on your projects, so I didn't get to find out how talented. But here you are now running a uh, your own ETF, an expert in this whole arena of of sustainability or ESG or impact investing or socially respond. I'm still confused on what we're going <laughs> to under you know call all these things. That's your job tonight. But uh, Sam, thank you for helping out here. And we did not have a chance to talk right before the show. I saw your PowerPoint that you have that you can work with. And there was part of me that said, God, just let them go. 
And there's another part of me, of course, that just loves getting into this stuff. But have you done this presentation together? Well, I, you know, um, Larry and I have done lots of presentations around uh, since we started writing the book together. And let me just um, say something about that. Larry has educated, it seems like half the world or more on the, the better ways to invest. Um, but he's also educated me on how to write. Like, this is my first book, right? So you, you can imagine the learning curve that I was on and, and yeah. having Larry there, to, to, all the, his wisdom from having written 17 or more books before uh, is very important. So I'd like to thank Larry uh, for that as well. Um, but yeah, we've done this presentation um, I, I, before, but you know, we like to keep, keep it in a, a question and answer format. Good. because let's do it. Let's you do it. You just then. touched on it, um, yep. Paul. There's lots of questions about this space, right? Uh, uh, of course, and and we opened the gate, the floodgate to the people coming out here, and lots of folks uh, have have questions. So there's no shortage of interest uh, in in this topic. So okay. By the way, I, I don't know. Did Jim mention because I didn't get in early enough to hear this about the new book that just came out days ago? Did he mention the new book? There it there is. We go. It is, by the way, have you looked at the reviews on your book? Yes. Would right. you be surprised to find out that somebody said it was complete? <laughs> I don't know anybody who writes books any more complete than you do, Larry. And Sam, I'm glad you got a chance to learn at the uh, feet of a master. Huh? <laughs> so, so I go back to the starting in the business in the 60s, and then I got out of the business yeah, as as you might have known it, the, the brokerage business yes. and whatnot. So I was there in the very early days, kind of, of the socially responsible investing movement. And it was simple and it was expensive. And and <laughs> it but then we didn't have index funds then either. Yeah. No, this it was a whole other world. And I would love it if if Sam, you know the history of this stuff. Yeah. The, give us the history. How did we get to where we are today? Yeah. And in the process, give these things a definition so we'll know what we're talking about. Sure, sure. That's a that's a great place to start. And and um, social responsible investing goes way back, uh, at least a hundred years uh, in modern form, but far more than that, um, because there are. There's text in, in in the Bible, in in the Torah of the, of of the what you know guidance on what investors should do with their capital and invest it according to their values. The one of the most often quoted uh, versions of this is the Quakers here in the U.S. encouraged their followers to not invest in any companies that profited from slave labor. Right. So this was a process of saying. We want to invest like normal investors for total return or maximize return for a given level of risk. But our values, our ethics, our morals, our religion, whatever, prohibit us or encourage us not to go in certain areas. Maybe it's avoiding alcohol or tobacco or a whole range of sin stocks, um, things that we fundamentally disagree with. And that was the way SRI or social responsible investing was for you know, a long, long time. And people still consider all forms of sustainable investing like ESG and impact investing, that form of investing. But there are some very important differences. Uh, ESG has a formation in that same kind of general value principle that we want things to be better for people and planet principally, but it has a very different methodology. And let me use a couple of slides here to just share with you what this means. I'm going to use this one. Now, can you see that? Yes. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. Here's how we kind of draw a landscape of the different sustainable investment options. You see conventional on the far left-hand side there. That's a typical investor who's investing for maximizing total return. And they really don't think about social or environmental outcomes when they're doing that. If they do have a social or environmental goal, they're probably taking care of it in the right-hand bucket in their philanthropy bucket. Some of your listeners from the Bainbridge Community Foundation know exactly what this is, right? Uh, and there, 
they're often giving the money away. So they don't have a financial consideration. It's more about the impact, maximizing a social environmental outcome. That SRI investor, as I said, sits right in the middle. They're saying, I want to make money. I want financial return, but I have some important values I want to consider in my portfolio formation. Now, you'll notice that ESG is in between there. It's over closer to conventional. And this is a very important distinction between SRI and ESG. SRI, we're looking at what the investor cares about, what's important to them alcohol, tobacco, gambling, guns, abortion, you know, those types of things. With ESG, the investors are looking at the companies and seeing what's important to them. What are the environmental risks and opportunities, the social risks and opportunities, and the governance risks and opportunities that that company faces that could have a material impact on their bottom line, right? So it's evaluating the companies and saying, oh, this is a company that uses lots of natural resources, that could be a risk. Or this is a company that doesn't treat their people very well, that could be a risk. Or this is a company that doesn't seem to have a board oversight over the management team, that could be a risk. That's very different from an individual investor saying, I have cancer in my family, I don't want to invest in tobacco companies. So that is the difference between value-driven and values-driven. Paul, you, just, could, you could see why I asked Sam to help me write the book. <laughs> and then to finish it off, the impact investment, which again, I'm sure the BCF uh, crew here know all about this. This is when you're taking capital and using it to solve a particular social environmental problem. I like to call it a for-profit version of philanthropy, where you've realized that some social environmental problems are better served with a for-profit model. Right. You could give cookless, I mean, smokeless cook stoves to thousands of, you know, sub-Saharan African villages, or you could build a for-profit distribution business that sells them or rents them and, and, and it would scale faster and maybe be maintained better over time, right? So you'd be solving that problem on, in a greater way than with a for-profit model. And that's really the, the genesis of impact investing. So here's the beautiful thing. Now, Investors have choices across these spectrums, right? And they have different, there's different methodologies and different outcomes uh, depending on the motivation. So this means then there begs the question, uh, and, and Larry, I'm sure that this is one you, you must have looked at long and hard. When I change and I limit myself to this group of investments what happens to the risk what happens to the return i and and sam i appreciate what you said about the idea that if you make more money doing it another way you have more money to give to others so you know that feels good and and uh but what about and, and early early on there was no question that that uh, sri investing was going to lag in terms of returns so what do you think, Larry? You've looked at it. I trust you. Can you make as much money doing it this way where you can live up to your values uh, as, as you would with having no values yeah. or, or having a different set of values? Well, it's a really complex question. Uh, let's see if we can give an answer. We cite about six, uh, 60 papers in the book. So as you know, Paul, when I write a book, I'm not giving my opinion. We're citing the academic literature so people can make their own decisions based upon the facts, not our opinions. So I think the place to begin here is to point out and start with this socially responsible investing from the way that Sam envisioned it. And if you think about investing, say, in companies like gambling, alcohol, tobacco, gun manufacturers. There's a whole group of people, uh, Quakers, for example, who have made the value-based decision to screen out those stocks and avoid investing in them. And it wasn't just the Quakers, lots of other people expressed their values. Well, economic theory is very clear and simple. If a whole group of investors screen out stocks and won't buy them, that doesn't change their earnings in any way. 
it just lowers their valuations relative to the stocks those people favor. Let's call them in today's language, the favorite stocks would be the green stocks and the disfavored or screened out stocks would be the brown or sin stocks. So the brown and sin stocks have lower PE ratios. You get a therefore a higher return for investing in them. And that's exactly what the literature showed. The, actually, I think if we polled your audience today and asked them what are the highest returning industries in the last hundred years, I think the vast majority would say technology, healthcare, but it's actually been the sin industries and that's true in the UK as well as the US. And the data showed up until about the last five years or so, and I'll touch on this next point uh, very importantly, up till about the last five years, those sin stocks had outperformed by somewhere in the two to 3% a year for the very reason that lots of people screened them out. So that's what we would call in economics a taste or behavioral preference reason for the outperformance of sin stocks and the underperformance of the green stocks. The Norway fund, one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world, over a trillion dollars, commissioned a study because they were doing uh, socially responsible investing for a, quite a while and they wanted to see the impact and they found that it cost their portfolio up till around 2016, I think the study ended, uh, over 1% a year. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that may be a perfectly rational decision. You could decide I'm willing to sacrifice 1% a year in terms of uh, be able to express my values. However, there's been a dramatic, and by the way, there's also, I would say, a risk-based explanation that's really important. Sam touched on this. If you've got the risk that your assets could be stranded by government regulation, for example, uh, that's a risk in that business, right? You have, if you have poor governance, you have risk of being lost, you know, lawsuits. You could have consumer boycotts because you don't treat your employees well. Uh, you could have risk of floods because you're building, you know, you're not protecting the environment. All kinds of risks. So if you want me to accept the risks of investing in companies that have exposure to those risks, that have poor ESG scores, then I'm going to demand the big risk premium. I'm not going to pay a higher price earnings ratio. You're going to have to pay me a risk premium as compensation for, if you will, holding my nose to buy these risky stocks. And the research does show that these brown and sin stocks actually are more risky. They have more event tail risk like the, say the Exxon Valdez incident. So that's the behavioral risk story. But we so Barry, have- Barry, can I just ask something yeah. here quickly? Yep. This, this idea that the investors demand higher rates of return. I understand a bank insurance company demanding a higher interest rate to borrow money if you were perceived to be more risky. But how do you, how do people think of an investor, myself? How do I demand a higher return? Uh, that may be complex. Well, no, I think I, th this is actually a fairly simple uh, uh, explanation. Think about this. You have two companies, both are earning, say, $10 a share. All right. And one is a green company, scores high on environment, social responsibility, and governance. And the other is a dirty brown company with assets that could be stranded, doesn't treat its employee well, has poor governance uh, rules that don't protect shareholders. The green company, I might be willing to pay, say, 20 times earnings for. This other company is clearly more risky. There's no way I'm going to pay 20 times earnings. For that, I may only pay 10 times earnings. But if the earnings are the same, if I pay 20 times earnings, I'm getting a 5% return on my capital. If I pay only 10 times, I'm getting a 10% return. Mm -hmm. So that's a simple way to think about it. So what happens is if enough people screen out those brown and sin stocks or companies that score poorly on ESG, then it will lower their PE ratios. 
they'll have to pay higher cost of debt. And that's exactly what the research shows that the brown companies, because they have lower ESG scores, have higher costs of debt and lower PE ratios. Yeah. And the green companies have the better scores and then end up having higher valuations. Now, two things are really important. I really want to touch on here for our audience to understand. You can have a conflicting force going on. And this is what's happened. And there has always been a slow movement. You can think of it like a hockey stick towards ESG. And there was a little bit of money every year flowing more and more into ESG good companies, okay? And ESG mutual funds and stuff. And then around 2017, it became a torrent and a flood with tens of billions of dollars moving every month into ESG to today, total dollars are probably about 40, maybe even 50% of all money invested. And that torrent of money has pushed up the PE ratios of the green stocks, giving them short-term capital gains because the valuations are going up, but you're not changing their earnings. So the long-term impact is going to be lower expected returns. And the SIN stocks are relatively speaking, having lower PEs and therefore lower, uh, sorry, higher expected return. So let's say you have a two or 3% premium for the SIN stocks, but so much money comes in that PE ratios go up quite a bit. They could generate an extra five or 6% a year return because PEs are going up, swamping the two to 3% risk premium or preference premium. And I personally think we're in the early innings here. Maybe it's the third, fourth, fifth inning uh, of the ball game of this transition to an equilibrium when everyone's invested the way they want to be. So in the near term, which I think is probably at least several more years, maybe it's longer, we could see green stocks outperforming brown, even though brown stocks have higher expected returns. But eventually, once you reach that equilibrium, that risk story and the preference should play out. Now, the last point I want to make is this. Investors get to feel really good that they're living their values and actually changing the world because companies notice that those cash flows are going to companies with good ESG scores. They say, I'm now uncompetitive. I'm having to pay more to raise equity. I'm having to pay more for my debt if I don't have a good score. So I'm changing my behavior and to get good scores and then money flows into my stock and my bonds, lowers my cost of capital, help me be more competitive. There is definitely very clear evidence that ESG sustainable investors can really feel good that they are actually changing corporate behavior in a big way. So, uh, Sam, the the difference between uh, the, the I'll call them growth and value. Actually, okay. is that the way it is kind of working out? Is that that a, that's a good analogy? I think right. I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, you know. Uh, at least in the past, people bid up growth stocks, and so they had lower expected returns, and they disliked whether it was preference or risk. I don't think we've still got an answer for that, right, Larry? We've, right. we've been wrestling with that one for you know uh, 30 years now, whether it's risk or preference. Uh, and we just know that value stocks have higher expected returns for either one of those reasons. This is, I guess, a good analogy for that. If a group of investors feel more comfortable or like uh, greener firms, they're, they're exactly what Larry uh, said is going to happen. Now, there's a nuance here I do want to tease out. The social responsible investing data goes back 80, 100 years because we know what a tobacco, alcohol, gambling company is, right? But the, the ESG form of investing was only invented in 2005, and we didn't really have data on carbon emissions and you know employee uh, treatment and you know those types of things. We that's younger, and so some of this data 
uh, where we're relying, we're relying on these academic studies to tell us what's going to outperform or underperform in the future is limited. I know 10 or 15 years sounds like a lot of data, but in an academic world, it's not a lot, right? We want hundreds of years if we can get it, right? Or at least dozens of years. And so this is why Larry and I talk about the theory a lot, is because we have to rely a little bit more on uh, that in these cases. So it these theories that it makes sense when more people like this group of stocks, they, they raise in value and then they have lower expected returns over time, like growth stocks. Um, and then the sin stocks are shunned. And so they have lower prices and they have higher expected returns like value stocks makes a lot of sense and could be what happens going forward, except for the last point that Larry made, which is if the, if, if a lot of people make that move, and, and, and we've seen that since 2017, you'll see those people <laughs> that get in early are getting that uplift in the price. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with green stocks or brown stocks going forward, but we do know that climate change is an issue, right? Uh, income inequality is an issue, and it doesn't feel like these things are going away anytime soon. So it's possible anyways, that these things that we've seen happen, we're just gonna get more of. And I'm not saying in terms of directions of, of, of returns, right? But it may become uh, more of an issue for the difference between green and brown going forward, except for this countervailing issue, which is that most firms are now picking up on what Larry said, oh my gosh, all these investors want more responsibility, more sustainability from my behavior. This is the CEO talking. I better get my ducks in a row and be more sustainable, get higher scores, attract that capital. And that's the, the takeaway message for me, for a, for a lot of investors. When you invest for sustainability, you are joining that growing and now large cohort of investors who are pushing those CEOs demanding better responsibility. And that's what Larry said. You know, they can feel really good about that these companies are making changes at the behest of these investors. Well, let me uh, jump on this because I really have even more good news uh, for <laughs> investors good. other than the point that Sam and I have made that you can feel good but that your actions and directing stocks to good scoring companies is changing behavior. And you hit on it uh, in your analogy to growth stocks versus value stocks. So the research does show that value stocks tend to have higher expected returns. And it also shows that smaller companies have higher returns and more profitable companies have higher returns and more quality companies that are the kind of stocks Warren Buffett bought with more stable earnings not a lot of financial or operating leverage. Uh, we talk about this research in the book. And so what fund families like Dimensional Fund Advisors have done is they have designed a series of sustainable funds that weight a portfolio tilted towards the good scoring companies. They don't entirely screen out bad companies, uh, but they weighted heavily toward the good screening companies but then make sure those, that portfolio has more exposure to value, profitability, smaller stocks. So even if the, the theory does hold true, which the evidence says it does, as well as the logic, that if you screen out these stocks, you get lower returns, but you can recapture those higher returns by tilting the, the green stocks you own to being cheaper, more profitable, higher quality companies. And so companies like Dimensional have built portfolios uh, to do that. So there you're getting your cake and eating it too. You get to express your values and you can capture those higher expected returns as well. So the science is really evolving in a good way. And we have a lot of clients who use those Dimensional funds. So there's a question in the, um... Paul, in the, in the chat that I'd want to answer that's around this value investing, uh, Daniel asks, 
um, about alternatives to the dimensional value funds or these new ones. Uh, Avantis has launched some ESG ETFs that have a value tilt. Um, there are also ones from other providers. Nuveen has some. Uh, you can go to uh, your financial advisor and ask them, or you can go to Morningstar, which has a, great, a, a lot of tools now to help you find uh, value tilted and small cap tilted um, funds and ETFs that have an ESG uh, strategy. Um, there's less of them than there are in the general equities category, but there's more and more launched uh, all the time. So you can definitely uh, find that now. So since you brought up small cap value, uh, that kind of leads us into specific, the specific desire to build a portfolio on factors. Uh, not everybody's going to know what that word means in terms of investing. Uh, Larry, do you want to, you're the factor king. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, we wrote a book, you're a complete guide to factor investing. Right. So. right. Think about it this way. Uh, a factor is nothing more than a trait or characteristic of a company. Uh, and Warren Buffett has been telling people there are certain traits of companies that he likes and that has enabled him to be successful. So what kind of companies did he like? He liked to buy companies that were cheap and profitable and they tend to be more higher quality, as I mentioned earlier, or more stable earnings. They, they're not like an airline with massive operating leverage that if only a small drop in the rev, you know, number of people flying happens, their earnings get killed and a small increase will drive it way up. He wants more stable uh, you know, kind of earnings. A Coca-Cola, for example, would be there. And the research shows, by the way, if you bought those kind of stocks, you got the same returns as Warren Buffett did, by the way. Warren Buffett's genius was not stock picking. His actual genius was that he identified these traits or characteristics 30, 40 years before the academics finally caught up with him. In effect, reverse engineering. Let's see, hey, look at the stocks he buys. Can we identify some common traits or characteristics? And they found out that low PE high ROA, return on assets or gross profitability, things like that, we're able to predict the returns. And then fund companies like Dimensional, the, your, your listener asked about Avantis, by the way, their team came out of Dimensional, another great group of people. We use both of their fund families uh, as well. So these are common traits that the academics have found there really are about four or five for stocks that, that matter, and you really could limit them to three or so. One of them is small stocks tend to outperform value or cheaper companies, and it doesn't matter whether you use low price to earnings, low price to cash flow, low price to book value, or almost any other metric, you're going to get a value premium. Uh, and companies that have higher profitability and lower debt, that's called quality. So you could look at just profitability or you could look at quality uh, and they have outperformed. And that's all you really need. And the funds that we use all tilt portfolios to those factors. Now that does mean, I have to point out, you're gonna look entirely different than the S&P 500 or a total market fund, which means although most of the time, especially the longer the horizon, you're going to outperform historically, there could be long periods you will underperform. And you have to accept that as the price for being different. Just one little bit of data as just an example. If you built a small cap value portfolio over a three year period, it outperforms probably two thirds of the time. That means one third of the time it underperforms and it's painful when that happens because all your friends are outperforming. And over five years, it's maybe 70%. And over 10 years, it's 80 or 85%. And at 20 years, it's almost 100%, but nothing's 100%. Yeah. So you have to be able to live with the risk. And for those interested, you can read my book, Your Complete Guide to Factor-Based Investing. But it's really actually much simpler uh, than the academics portray it. It's just understanding 
that there are certain common traits or characteristics that the literature has found have delivered higher returns either because they're riskier companies and therefore you should get a risk premium, or there's just a preference that people have for certain stocks that cause them to overpay for them and you want to avoid them. I'll give you a couple of examples. IPOs have terrible returns on average. Yeah. The worst performing stocks are what a lot of individuals love to buy, the kind of stocks in Kathy Wood's portfolio, which are small growth companies with low profitability, high investment. Over the long term, they have underperformed treasury bills. But every once in a while, we get a bubble, yeah. and they, like we had in the late 90s, and we had from 2017 through 20, and they massively outperform the bubble bursts, and then the air comes out of that bubble. Uh, so you have to be careful. You've got to be prepared when those periods happen that you don't abandon your well thought out strategy because it's going to happen for sure. sure. We just don't know when. So uh, let's let's assume then that we have a portfolio of large and small and value and growth. And we have these long periods of difference that make us uncomfortable. Let's say that whether we do all of those different asset classes and factors, let's say though that we have a, a, a portfolio of ESG designed around the factors. And, and so you do, again, I wanna, we wanna know more about the ability to to take your book, because your book covers this, your new book, and and to be able to take it and and build a portfolio that shouldn't be out of sync. I mean, when small is is doing well, then the ESG small value should be doing well, and wow. and the and the growth that it would be relatively dependable, so that. If we're out of sync, it's because we're in small. It's not because we're in small ESG. Yeah. Because I That's think that'll exactly. confuse people. If yeah. not your, your analysis is exactly right. You could design a portfolio with that's good ESG and looks exactly like the market and will have an like 0.95 or 99 correlation to the market and it will look similar. Or... You could design a portfolio like Dimensional does, and it will look a bit different, but you'll have good ESG scores and it will tend to outperform when small in value and profitable companies outperform. And it will tend to underperform when large and growth and less profitable companies outperform. And you have to decide which strategy you want. You can say, I want to look like the market, so I don't have this, what's called tracking error. And that's right for you because I'm a big believer and I'm sure Sam would agree. The right portfolio is the one that will most likely you will be able to stick with because reason people fail is they don't have discipline. Warren Buffett said it best. Investing is incredibly simple. It's not easy because you have to live with the pain of underperforming for often long periods of time to reap the rewards of looking different from the market. And, so, and that, Sam, that brings, uh, oh, you were gonna say something, Sam? Well, I wanted to sh share with the, the audience the, the most unnecessary slide in our deck, which is the, the picture of what Larry and you just said, which is, here's the difference between a conventional asset allocation and a sustainable asset allocation. It, <laughs> it looks very similar, right? Now I didn't put small and value in there, but in a perfect world, you'd be able to replicate completely your existing asset allocation with a sustainable one and then just choose ESG uh, ETFs and funds to replace that. We're almost there. We're, we're getting close to that being able because that's the big driver of your returns and your performance, your ups and downs is what your asset allocation. Don't throw that out, right? Uh, try and keep that close because while we know because we have 80, 100 years of data, the differences in returns between uh, value and growth and small and value, um, we don't really know yet if ESG is going to have that kind of profound effect or not. So yes. the prudent thing to do is keep those big levers the same, your asset allocation the same, 
and then find your ESG tilted portfolios that are comfortable for you, pushing into sustainability as far as you want, but not too far to get, as Larry says, get you jumping out of your seat at the wrong time. Yeah, but you, uh, Paul, you, uh, one last point on this, which is yep. really uh, hits home, I think addresses the issue you've raised. One of the studies of the 60 or so we cite in the book is a study done by people who created what they call the vice fund. So all the sin stocks, right? Mm. And they found that it had outperformed by in the neighborhood of, I think the number is like 2.7% a year over a long period of time. And then they said, let's see if that outperformance could be explained by their exposure to these factors. And that's exactly what happened. It was nothing special about the stocks. It was these companies were cheap and more profitable and they tended to be not wasteful of investment. They were wise in how much they, so they didn't overinvest, if you will. So that explanation helps you understand if you take the kind of approach that dimensional does yeah. and factor tilting, you should get those expected returns and be able to express your values at the same time. We have yeah. one more. Oh, go, go, Sam. No, you're the well, just just to know that, you know, there's different degrees of tilt to small cap. You know, you could yeah. go mid, you can go small, you can go micro, you can kind of go from growth to light value, you know, or deep value. And that all those moves increase your tracking error. Similarly with ESG, if you go from a fund that had a thousand stocks to 800 stocks, as it kicks out the bad guys and is more ESG, you kind of have a similar experience. If you go from a thousand stocks to a hundred stocks, right? You got way more into sustainability, but don't expect the, that fund to look like that market fund, right? And these are the choices that investors uh, uh, should make according to their own uh, desires. Now, it varies by person, but as a group, very interesting behavioral studies show that sustainable or socially responsible investors have longer holding periods. They're more... I guess, uh, more fans of the companies that they're in or the strategies that feel better about it. So when times get tough, they tend to stick in. They try to, they yeah. stay disciplined, which is great uh, is because the they have more successful investment experiences as a result. Well, we have one more fork in the road here for sure, where we have to either throw the bums out or let them in. And that is the decision, are we going to load this thing, this portfolio, with index ESG funds or actively managed ESG. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I, I know where your heart is and where your evidence is, but give them a shot. Can you say anything good about the actively managed funds? Not the ones that got lucky. Well, I'll take, I'll, I'll take a shot. There's actually a lot of good research on this subject. And uh, there's actually an interesting new paper by a professor, Nanigan, out of California, who looked at this. Uh, and I think the right way. So first, I'm sure everyone's very familiar with the evidence. Active managed funds, on average, do very poorly over the long term. And unfortunately, there's no evidence of any persistence of performance beyond the randomly expected. So you can't rely on past performance. All kinds of consultants have tried to look at things, for example, something called active share, where you really build concentrated portfolios that don't look like the market. And their theory was that would allow you to concentrate your bets in the best picks. And the first study came out and claimed that that worked and subsequent research found that that was dead wrong. And it, even the person who wrote the original paper just came out with another and says, there's no evidence that active share, even with past performance, has no predictive value in mutual funds. However, here's the thing that people have to understand that I've written about. And I think even John Bogle is quoted as saying, active management fails not because it's stupid, it fails because it's expensive. expensive. Yeah. And so uh, there are even some negatives that I've written about in my books and articles. There are some negatives of indexing, which companies like Dimensional have exploited by 
either structuring portfolios that minimize those negatives and or eliminate them. Uh, we may not have time to go into them, but there are a series of them. Uh, of uh, things. Well, give you, us the biggest one, just one that would give well, us- Well, the thing. biggest one, for example, is forced trading. Index funds have to trade whenever the index changes and all the hedge funds and active managers, uh, you know, high frequency traders know, and they front run. And there's a great example, the Russell 2000, a small cap index, has underperformed a similar index run by the um, CRISP, the Center for Research and Security Price in Chicago, by like 2% a year, mostly for that reason. So people like Dimensional say, we don't have to trade around that. There's also a whole bunch of stocks that are small slivers of the market, but if you screen them out, you dramatically improve returns. Penny stocks, less than 1% of the stocks in bankruptcy ever return a penny to investors, yet they trade and they're in indexes, but why do you want to own them, well, right? Uh, IPOs, I mentioned, small growth stocks have had very poor returns, if, especially if they were not profitable. So fund families like Dimensional, Avantis, Bridgeway, AQR, they just screen out those stocks and say, we won't buy what are called these lottery stocks. So you can improve on that. Well, active managers can do the same thing. And so if you keep your expenses to relatively comparable to index funds, maybe a bit higher, 10 or 20 basis points more, and then you could take advantage by patiently trading, not forced trading. I love this stock. I need to buy it today uh, or I need to dump it today. Dimensional, for example, every trade they do today literally is 100 shares because they don't want to move the market and push prices against them. So I did not have, know that. Literally is 100 yep, shares? That's basically true. Yep. Wow. Every trade is little. It's all done by an algorithmic program that feeds in tiny trades. So no one knows what they're doing and doesn't impact the market. That's and it. that's what the sophisticated funds are doing. So if you can create an active fund that looks like the dimensionals and Avantis of the world, which Vanguard has done, they have very low cost active funds, then there's no reason they can't be competitive with a good index fund that maybe is cheaper and maybe they can slightly outperform. And that's what David Nanigan found. There's virtually no difference between low cost active funds and low cost index funds. Yeah. And here's the beauty of the efficient markets theory, Paul. The efficient markets theory says the market's not perfectly efficient, but it's highly efficient. That means the prices that are quoted are the best estimate of the right price. Now that protects me if I'm a dumb, naive retail investor. I don't know anything about stocks. I don't have to worry that I'm buying a stock that's overvalued because the market's quoting its best estimate at the right price. But that means that an active manager who's smart can't exploit me, but it also means a dumb active manager can't go too far wrong because they're buying at the same right price, right? So that's what the research, David Nanigan really wrote a nice paper. I just finished writing up a draft and explaining that he's really saying what Farmer has said all along, boy, the market is highly efficient. And what Bogle is saying, active managers failed, not because they're dumb, they're just too expensive. So uh, let, me, <laughs> let me tie this uh, active passive question into ESG real quick, Paul, because sure. as Larry described, it's gotten really complicated. It's not like back in the 90s where we had active and we had index, it was black and white, and it was easy. That entire space has been filled in by fundamental and quant and all these different types of, you know, advances, dimensional and those types of things. And so sometimes it's hard to determine what's, you know, active and what's passive because very few are actually slavishly tracking the indices now. Um, so, and very few uh, active guys are picking stocks and timing markets, right? Like they used to. Yeah. Um, and in ESG, it even gets a little bit more complicated because there aren't, really 
you know, well-defined ESG indices for lots of asset classes. And some of the ways that the indices are constructed are frankly, for lack of a more sophisticated term, garbage, right? We'll probably get into the ratings in a second. But because of that, when you have to examine an ESG manager, and I'll use our fund as an example, you have to look and see, are they being active or are they being passive, right? So when we built our ESG real estate fund, we invest in publicly listed uh, real estate companies, there wasn't an ESG index for real estate. And so we had to go find the quantitative measures that were important for uh, determining which companies were leaders on sustainability and which ones were laggard, and then go buy those uh, companies. Now that sounds a lot like stock picking, but we made it quantitative. So it was more like passive and in its long-term buy and hold. And in fact, Dimensional does the trading for us. So they capture the benefits that Larry was talking about. But because we're making significant choices different than an index, right? You might be confused and, and see it as active. And in that ESG space, you kind of want a manager to be applying some thought processes, okay, beyond slavishly following in indices for the problems that the indices have. Um, so there's one more nuance with ESG, active shareholder engagements in sustainable or social responsible funds means the manager is using the bully pulpit they've been given as the ringleader of all the shareholders in that fund to go communicate with the companies in the portfolio, hey, you should be doing this better, or you should be disclosing more information or those types of things. That's not active management, that's doing stewardship, that's doing advocacy and engagement with the companies uh, and lots of um, managers active and passive uh, do that on the ESG side, but it's don't confuse it with active management. Yeah, Paul, I think it would be helpful because as Sam said, you have the spectrum and People use the term in confusing ways. So the way I like to describe for people that I think is most helpful, active means you're engaging in individual security selection and or market timing based upon your judgment. And that means it's not replicable. So you have two different people running the same fund. They could make the very different decisions mm -hmm. about what stocks to buy, and when to be in and out of the market. I use the term instead of passive, I use structured and systematic. So mm -hmm. what that means is you design your portfolio to give you exposure to whatever factors or traits or characteristics you want. So you say my universe is, I'll just make something up, the small uh, stocks with a market cap of no more than 1 billion, uh, no, a PE of no more than 15, and they have to have, uh, you know, a certain return on assets if you're, or you're looking at profitability, or you're ranked in the top 25% of these categories. And now you buy every one of those stocks in a market cap way, and you can trade patiently, not, you know, when something leaves an index, I have to sell it. That doesn't make any sense. You could trade it very patiently. And to me, I would put that in the passive category, but clearly it's active in determining what your universe looks like, what the rules are, okay? But it's systematic and transparent and replicable. Those are the three key words. Uh, and the fund families who do that are like dimensional Avantis index funds are would certainly meet that category. AQR, uh, yeah, Larry, Black you got to start mentioning Vert. You keep mentioning these big and, guys. What about the the new ESG guys? Go, you go and put, in the put Vert at the top space, of that list. Yeah, the ESG space. There is this one really unique firm called Vert. <laughs> well, how much competition do you have, Sam? None. Right now, um, you know the 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 big institutional. Uh, investors who tend to buy pr uh, real estate privately or directly, like they'll buy the building or the land, um, they've been doing sustainability for a long, long time, right? And the, the, the academics on our advisory board and our investment research group have, ha have been publishing papers for decades linking, right, higher profitability, lower costs to better buildings and more sustainable buildings. That's been pretty well established. 
But um, there wasn't a, a retail available or advisor available mutual fund or ETF in the U.S. that did sustainability uh, as, its, as its strategy. And so when we launched it in 2017, we were the only ESG real estate fund. We still are. Um, you know, uh, I imagine great. BlackRock will come along at some point, but uh, we're, we're, we're still the, the only ones. So let's talk about the, the granddaddy of, uh, of mutual funds, uh, not BlackRock, but Vanguard. And uh, I'd be curious, first of all, about your ratings, because you are rating these funds yourselves, your ratings of the Vanguard ESG funds, and, and a discussion about the rating services. If they don't use your advice that you have in the book, what what advice should they be? Where should they go and, and, and have confidence in the information that they're getting? Sam, why don't you take this one? Okay. So the big picture on ratings is this, and this is probably the second most confusing thing about sustainable investing after the ESG SRI uh, dimension and, and the performance difference as a result. Sam, why don't you show that one slide we have? I think we have that slide with the dots. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, that was that was the one slide I was going to say. Whatever you do, don't show that <laughs> slide. <laughs> All right. Well, let me let me. Let I me don't show it. Up. Very well. I'll, I'll, I'll set it up and then show it, and maybe it'll make sense if we if we if we show it. That's a perfect Larry chart, right? Mm -hmm. um, so here's the thing: what, what when when J.P. Morgan or Morgan Stanley or one of these buy you know uh, stock analyst firms um, issues a buy, hold, or sell rating. This is the process that the analyst goes through. They look at a bunch of information, hundreds of data points, and then they say, this company, Coca-Cola, looks like a buy to me, and this company, Pepsi, looks like a sell, uh, and this company, Nestle, looks like a hold, right? And they come up with that opinion. And then the next firm down the Wall Street uh, looks at similar data and comes up with a different opinion. So they want to sell Coca-Cola while the other guys want to buy Coca-Cola. We like that. We like the difference of opinions, right? But we like also like the fact that all of those analysts are using the same data. They're using the same earnings figures. They're using the same financial statements. They're using the same, you know, that type of thing. With ESG, when Sustainalytics or Morningstar or MSCI comes out with a rating, A, B, C, or something like that, and it doesn't agree with someone else's rating, we get all upset. We're like, wait, that we want, we, they, should be to, they should be the same. No, 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 no. Because MSCI is looking at 187 data points mm -hmm. and Sustainalytics is looking at 132 data points and they might be different and then they weight them differently and you come up with a different rating, right? So Tesla gets a, a, gets a high rating on this system and you know Tesla gets a low rating on this other system. We should be completely fine with that because the ratings are nothing but opinions based on their format. Um, we want the data underneath to be the same. I'd really like to know how Tesla treats its employees. I'd really like to know what their efficiency use of natural resources is, right? So the result of this problem is what Larry's chart is. The, this chart is you're gonna see shows you why uh, it's, People want consistency, but they will never find it, uh, at least probably not over the next several years, because there are so much differences in what people choose and how they rate. Let me just give a simple example. If you're looking at I'm not at getting the, it, Larry. Yeah. Maybe everybody's getting it. Let me, let me try again. If, and yeah, Sam, will, Sam will get it. He'll, he'll, he'll get it. Okay, there, there we go. Is. So you could see here stocks in the bottom uh, left-hand corner there have low ratings on both, but there are stocks in the in the top left, uh, but uh, you know that have high ratings in MSCI, but very low ratings on Sustain Analytics. And if you go the other way to the bottom right corner, you see the reverse. Uh, and that can result from something as simple as, let's say, how do you decide on a sociability uh, rate ranking? Uh, meaning, how do you treat employees and they're looking at diversity? Do 
Do you look at number of women and minorities on the board? Do you look at differences in pay gaps? Do you look at number of managers and what level do you go down? There's all kinds of different ways to determine it and there is no right answer and people make their own judgments about those things. And there's even on, you know, on the emission side, it's very complex. Uh, for example, there's something called scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Scope one is what goes directly into the product you're producing. Scope two is what's in your supply chain. So it's the inputs that come into it. And scope three is includes all the things that go from the beginning to till the customer uses it, right? So Amazon, if you're looking at scope one and two, they don't make anything. Maybe they get their energy from solar panels and they get a high rating. But if someone's looking at scope three, they might say, what are all those trucks Amazon's driving around with diesel engines? And boy, they're bad. And so they get a lousy score. It's going, to, unless somebody decides, which I don't think will happen because you have seven raiders and they don't want to give up their uniqueness and marketplace. So I don't think we'll ever get consistency, except I think it is quite possible the SEC uh, on our accounting standards board could address the issue Sam uh, raised, which is what are the things we want everyone to look at and you must address them in your reporting and your disclosures. I think we're headed likely in that direction with mandatory transparency. Sam, maybe you want to add I'll on just to that. just wrap up, right? I mean, one of the, I, I'm sure, Paul, that in your financial literacy and education work, you, in, it, you encourage um, uh, investors to not rely on, you know, the Morningstar star rating or, right. you know, the U.S. News and World Report great fund list, right? <laughs> Those are not ways to ch choose investments. Um, and the similar warning should be given around sustainability. If it says five globes or AAA or whatever from some rating agency, that's not a reason to uh, say that it's a good sustainable investment. What we encourage uh, investors to do is do their financial due diligence homework first, right? Get their asset allocation set up. And then when they're evaluating uh, an ESG uh, ingredient for their portfolio, okay? I know this sounds like a lot of work, but actually find out what the manager is doing. Read the prospectus and talk to them, look at their materials because that is a faster, way faster and quicker way of finding out whether they're doing what you want them to be doing than looking at all these numbers and, and letters that get pumped out by the rating agencies. Yeah, so uh, go Paul, uh, I really want to jump on uh, Sam's point about doing that due diligence because the research is showing that the mutual funds have recognized that there's this huge increase in demand for ESG funds, and they're engaging in what is called greenwashing, just slapping an ESG or sustainable name onto their fund and without changing their behavior or the types of stocks, in some cases it even deteriorates. But they know the cash flows comes in because it does take the work that Sam said to put into it to, to do that. I, I had one other thing we encourage people in the book uh, to do is now today with the big uh, expansion towards direct indexing being much cheaper, you can build your own portfolios. You don't have to have a $10 million portfolio any longer to do that. You can create your own ESG screens expressing your unique values, screening in or screening out whatever industries you want. Uh, and so that's what a lot of our clients do. We work with two fund, uh, two fund managers, uh, people build portfolios, Aperio and Parametric, as well as Dimensional will build portfolios. So that's a trio. I do want to add one other thing for your listeners to really consider hard, because I think far too many people make a bad mistake when they think about sustainable investing. And for example, screening out say an oil or an energy company because they're polluting. Now let's think about why that might be a bad thing to do. 
what you really want to encourage, right, is how do we get technology to make the world a greener space and less polluted? Guess which companies are cranking out the most green patents by far? It's the energy company. So if you deprive them of your capital, it makes it more expensive for them to raise it and they won't have the money to invest in those patents. So what I think is a better strategy is what Dimensional and others are doing is creating a best in class type of strategy and ranking companies by their industry. So it could be a brown industry, but they're relatively green. Now that's my personal view. Somebody else may have their own personal things and they could decide to screen them out. Okay, but you should understand that, that you're having an impact that it may be direct opposite to what your goal is. So, so you, me, you, go ahead, Sam, please. Let me tie that to the difference between ESG and SRI um, and what investors are actually trying to accomplish, right? And for the SRI investor, it's like, get bad actors out of my fund out of my I don't I can't hold Exxon Mobil I can't you know or what I just I can't hold the gun manufacturer that's just the way I feel great fantastic please go build that portfolio if it helps you hold on to it longer that's a fantastic outcome All right but other investors want to say we need oil and gas we need mining we need the system to transform and so what I want to do is invest in the companies that are preparing for and accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy. I want the big energy providers to do that. So give me the guys that are doing that. And the poster child for this is Total, the French company, right? They've made commitments to switch to 100% renewable energy, but they haven't abandoned their oil and gas mines because they have value in them. And that would be imprudent and <laughs> abandoning their fiduciary responsibilities. But they're not drilling for more. They're not, you know, uh, building more capacity for something that's going away. So they they won't have stranded assets or they'll have less than others. And they're pushing the, into the technology space of figuring out how to use those wells that they already have to capture carbon and put it underground and all these amazing things that we're going to need, right? So I'm that type of investor like Larry, where I would rather affect the system, okay? And if we're giving the more capital to the companies that are pushing into the future, and less to the ones that are sticking their heads in the sand or holding on to the past, that's the kind of effect that we want to have. And let me give you a historical story. You know, it was Lord Brown, the CEO of uh, BP back before the turn of the century, he renamed British Petroleum to Beyond Petroleum. Well, the stock price crashed and he got turfed out, okay? <laughs> we, fast forward, we have a couple of scandals, Deepwater Horizon, all those types of things. Now BP says we're going back to beyond petroleum. We're making commitments to go renewable energy. Stock market now recognizes climate change, all these risks, thumbs up, stock price goes up. This is the investor role from my perspective. We want to give CFOs and CEOs the rope, the support, okay, and the backing to make these changes. And if that CEO is looking over his shoulder and says, I've got a third of the assets in the world that want sustainability, I can do that. But if they're looking over their shoulder and they don't see anybody, they're not going to be able to make those long-term investments. So, so I, as you guys know, I work for nothing. The only thing that we work for is for a better financial future for the people we're trying to educate. Uh, and I love trying to do it here on Bainbridge as best we can. And we really appreciate you coming and, and, and joining us. Uh, our foundation is going to, after I read your book, Larry and Sam, uh, I said to Chris and Daryl, we have to come up with portfolios uh, for the ESG funds uh, to, to help the folks that want that. And so... Uh, you have your recommendations in the book. We'll do our research and we'll come up with some names that we, we like. We just want to know whether you'll be kind enough at the price that our foundation can afford to review our recommendations before we release them to the public. Um, my, my price 
for that is the same price that you charge. <laughs> okay. All right. Larry, I didn't hear your answer. Uh, Sam, Sam is going to know the answer about whether they are uh, going to be actually walking the walk better than I will. That's love. great. That's uh, great. So, but, you know, that's Sam's expertise is really digging in and understanding those issues. My expertise is more on the academic research yes. on risk and returns. So we made a great team in putting that book together. What about Vanguard? I didn't hear comments on what Vanguard Sam? has done. Well, so here's, I think of the landscape of ESG offerings in terms of that tilt, okay, on uh, across how strong do you want to tilt to ESG versus not? Um, and at the moment, most of the Vanguard index funds are pretty light green on the tilt, but I wouldn't be surprised if they came out with other ones or if you looked at some of their other partners uh, that they work with that has some more uh, stronger tilts. Uh, Wellington, for example, is very, very deep into the uh, ESG space. Um, so that's one dimension to look at, the actual holdings and how green versus brown are the holdings. And then there's other dimensions to look at that active shareholder engagement. Are they using their power as the common you know, a group shareholder to encourage companies to do more or not? And there's important nuances there. Some uh, index managers take a kind of hands-off approach. Some are very involved behind the scenes. Uh, and some push on certain issues, like Dimensional is very good at pushing on the governance issues, probably better than most, um, but take a lighter a touch, uh, letting management decide how to handle E and S issues. Um, and so that's another lens uh, to look at. Um, I'm not in the habit of throwing anyone under the bus. If they're sustainable, I kind of like them, except for the greenwashers that, uh, that Larry was talking about. Um, and let me uh, reserve a comment for that. Um, greenwashing is a problem, but spare me the outrage, right? Like you cannot color me surprised that a financial services firm, an investment management company, a, a, a fund company is saying, we have this great program that's going to give you 5% alpha. And by the way, it's going to save the polar bears. This is what investors have been facing for. That's what the business years. is. <laughs> there, there's some fantastic story of high returns and low risk. And we go, huh? This is just the same thing in a different colored uh, wrapping. Well, at the end of the day, I still believe we have to come down between the choice of believing Wall Street, Main Street, or University Street. Oh. And one of the reasons I have been such fans of Larry's work and now your work, Sam, is that the academic community uh, wins. They aren't perfect either, but they're sure a far way ahead of the other choices. So, uh, Paul, here's a thought that might be helpful for your listeners who are, you know, interested in the subject, but are not going to put in the time and effort to do the reading that Sam said. I'm sure there are some people who will do it, but my experience tells me most won't do it. So what you want to do then is I would say like three things. You could go to look at the funds and then look at one, I want to see low expenses because high expenses are the surest way to get lousy returns. Yep. So you want to look at relatively low expense, not necessarily the lowest expense, because you want to be expressing your values and you want to see if you want to have higher exposure to these factors. Uh, sometimes the cheapest funds may have very small exposure to the size and value. And I'll give a good example of that. Then you want to look at how the companies are doing and to giving you exposure to say small cap and value stocks. So a simple example would be Vanguard's index fund for small value. Now, I haven't looked at it recently, but the last time I looked at it, the average market cap was about 5 billion, yeah. and the average PE was something like 17 or something. That is neither small nor cheap. The Bridgeway fund, is, which is my personal favorite if you want to get really small in value, is a bit more expensive. However, the average market cap was about a billion. So, you know, 20% the size and the PE ratio was nine, which was about half or something like that. 
of the Vanguard fund. So I'm willing to pay, say, 20, 30 basis points more because I think that fund has maybe one and a half percent or so higher expected returns because of that exposure. And then the third thing you can do is then look, say, at Morningstar. They have a globe rating for funds. And you could say, I won't buy something unless it's at least a three or a four, or it has to be a five or whatever. And there's three simple things you could do. Low cost, if you want desired factors, you can look on Morningstar and it will show you, you know, how, what the size and value factors are. And then you can look at globe ratings and that'll get you maybe 80 or 90% of the way that the extra work that Sam does would get you. So let us understand though, in your book, because a book is relatively cheap time-wise, when you come right down to it, there's nothing cheaper than a book. <laughs> well, we, that's one of the things, good. just so you know, books like ours often sell, our book is gonna be used in colleges mm -hmm. as textbooks. Uh, and we see books going for a hundred dollars or more I insisted that Harriman keep the cost under 20 bucks, make it a paperback so the average reader it would not be a big expense yep. for them. And Harriman agreed to do that for us. It's one yeah. of the reasons I chose to work with Harriman. Interesting. And, and uh, as far as people who want to do it themselves, well, I will tell you where I think everybody, all trustees, of nonprofits or on the board of a 401k that wants to get into the ESG business offering either for like we have on our on on the island the Bainbridge Community Foundation does use ESG funds and we did focus on low expenses and all the things uh, that you're referring to but I think every trustee uh, should be reading a book like yours and I don't know another book like yours that I that I've found, Larry, but and and Sam, but that is important for them to understand the differences because the differences are huge over time. Remembering every extra half a percent we make over our lifetime, and the beauty of a foundation investment that goes for hundreds of years. I mean, that half a percent is a big, big deal, and. Do you agree that with wise choice, there is an extra half a percent? Oh, I, I think you can live your, as we say in the book, we can, you can live your values and achieve your goals. And because the research shows that's exactly what you can do. If you, it depends on what your objectives are. If your objectives are purely expressing your values, and you want to, you know, then you're likely to sacrifice returns. If you're willing to live your values and not look like the market tilted to these factors, then you get the best of both worlds. And you can do even better by building your own unique portfolio to exactly express your values and tilt at the same time. I, I, my favorite analogy is a food analogy. Uh, Paul, um, when my wife and I started, we had kids, we started preferring organic food. Uh, and that was uh, kind of a long time ago. So there wasn't a lot of organic food in the grocery stores. Uh, it was kind of hard to do. You had to go to special stores and you had to ask and, you know, and now it's really easy, right? It's kind of everywhere. And we haven't changed our menu. We haven't changed the way we cook. We haven't changed a lot of things. Uh, you know, we haven't changed our nutrition plan. But when we go to the store and we fill our basket, if there is an organic item next to a conventional item and it's not quadruple the cost or sometimes you see that, we'll pick it up. If it's not there, we'll get the conventional one. And, you know, we don't think we're going to die of pesticide uh, inhalation from one piece of bread or whatever. So we, we, we come home, we cook it up and listen, it's the similar outcome, probably nutritionally, there's less bad stuff in it. Um, but we feel really good about our choices and about sending that signal to the store, which sends a signal to the agriculture and the food producers. Hey, more of this, please. You know, less bad stuff, more sustainability. That'd be nice. And we're feeling like we're part of that movement. We haven't disrupted our lives too much. And so when I think about that, I think about investing and I'm like, listen, we're putting this capital somewhere. 
right? Yeah. As long as we keep the rules uh, of, of investing the same and we don't throw that out, we can do sustainability, feel great about the portfolios, make some improvements in the world, shift capitalism to a, a better way of operating. It's all good. Yeah, Paul, Paul I know we're going to wrap up soon. So yep. I just want to make sure we get this message in from Sam and I. Uh, in all my books, including this one, I always have my email address. Sam and I are always happy to answer any question that you have. We've given you both our emails. If you have a question, you read the book, just shoot us an email and we're happy to address your, your yeah. questions. So pick up a copy of the book and recommend it to your friends and help spread the word that you can live your values and achieve your financial goals at the same time and help the world. And, and, and by the way, and I've said this many times, I really, when people ask, which is my favorite of Larry's books, my answer is any of them. And, and, and <laughs> the I really, <laughs> uh, well, no, I'm, because they're so very different. They're this, there's a, a, a lifetime of, from very simple storytelling to, to more complex work. You guys, I really appreciate you coming on. It's, it's, I know it's going to be beneficial to uh, a lot of the viewers. We are going to uh, have this on YouTube, uh, uh, both either, either at Bainbridge Community Foundation uh, or at uh, our website, paulmerriman.com. And uh, we will continue this conversation uh, offline and we will pass your remarks certainly along uh, to the people who follow our work, and we we appreciate you sharing your lifetime of knowledge. Thank you very much. Golf player, always to help you out, Paul. You've been truly one of the up there with John Bogle. Hard to be on that same pedestal, but you're close yeah. in helping yeah, yeah, yeah. people achieve their goals, doing the right thing. Yeah, it's nice well, to nice to be on a panel with legends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, by the way, Sam. I want you to know, I looked at the uh, the book reviews, somebody's calling you a legend, so watch <laughs> out. It's costly, I'll tell you. <laughs> thank you all, and thank you folks for, for coming out. I know we didn't get to questions tonight, but a few, but I also know that if you got a serious one, that both Larry and Sam are willing to help you, and they know uh, a, a, obviously a lot about this. All the best next week. It is Mary Beth Franklin. I'm going to be peppering her with every tough social security question I know. And she's good. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you all. Sam. Take care, Thanks, everybody. everybody.